Good evening, South Asia. Good afternoon, Europe. Welcome to the final session of today's Connecting Germany and South Asia. Um, the session today is called Global Networks, the role of alumni relations in internationalization. My name is Nena Narke. I am responsible for alumni affairs here at the DAD regional office, New Delhi, and I will take you through the session today. It's my absolute pleasure to host this session that focuses on the role of alumni in the context of internationalization, um, which it intends to tackle from different perspectives, which is why I'm very glad to welcome the panel and introduce them to you. But before that, I'd like to uh, tell the audience that you can type in your questions throughout the session in the chat function of uh, WebEx, and I'll be happy to pick them up after the presentations. So feel free to engage with us in the, in the chat. Firstly, I'd like to welcome Dr. Cornelius Sandhu of the Dresden University of Applied Sciences. He holds a PhD in environmental engineering from the Technical University of Dresden. He has authored six and co-authored 23 scientific journal articles and book chapters on river bank filtration, RBF, in India. He has 16 years of experience in the field of RBF-based water supply from participation in national and international research and several training projects in South Asia and Egypt, including the DAD program, A New Passage to India, and the DAAD DST project-based personal exchange program. He has also more than three years of teaching experience in solid waste management, mining, and resources management, groundwater engineering, and uh, managed aquifer recharge. Welcome, Dr. Sindhu. We are very glad to have you on the panel. Thank you very much, Ms. Narke. Uh, <clears throat> a very good afternoon and namaskar to everybody also from Dresden. Uh, and um, I will today take you on a short story uh, yeah, on how uh, the DA, the alumni can strengthen the Indo-German network and the internationalization. And uh, I would like to start now and I just switch off my video and of course <clears throat> I hope that you can all see the slides. <clears throat> so um, I would also like to at this stage thank my co-authors that is uh, Professor Thomas Grishek who's uh, from the University of Applied Sciences. He chairs the Division of Water Sciences. He's the head of it and uh, my esteemed colleague Dr. Medelson Ronghang whom I'll be talking to you about a bit more. So I would just like to briefly start with the background and um, one of the main motivation and especially also behind all the research, because after all, uh, the DAAD specializes in the funding of uh, creating the linkages and establishing, let's say, <clears throat> the mobility, especially so that we can do our research. So one of this is uh, water resources management and especially integrated water resources management. I think most of us uh, are well aware about some of the problematic and especially it is uh, the discharge of partially to untreated wastewater uh, into Indian uh, surface waters. This is not only a problem in India, it's a ubiquitous problem, I would say, in the South Asian subcontinent. And uh, some of the aspects which are particularly uh, critical or crucial are the presence of pathogens and now also emerging pollutants. And uh, if you look at the conventional water treatment, the, uh, uh, these technologies are not, I would say, um, in many conventional water treatment plants, these technologies are not uh, suited for the removal of these um, uh, pollutants. Uh, another issue is, of course, the recurring monsoon floods, as we've also seen now, for instance, also in Kerala, where there's widespread damage done to the water infrastructure. And of course, one approach is integrated water resources management, and one such example is managed aquifer recharge. And uh, the riverbank filtration, which Ms. Narke talked about, well, that is one element of uh, or a component of managed aquifer recharge, and including also integrated water resources management. So essentially, if one has a well close to a river and one pumps the water out, after a while, the water travels through the subsurface to the well, and during this process, it gets purified. I will not go into the details. Nevertheless, 
uh, a portion of the water which we pump out comes from the river and another portion could be groundwater. So one is also indirectly lessening the uh, impact on groundwater resources or one is in a way lessening the depletion of groundwater resources. And of course, there are a lot of other advantages of using bank filtration, such as it's a pretreatment that is the most important, not only for drinking, but also industrial and irrigation water. Uh, it is also robust against climate change. Uh, it can guarantee if the wells are constructed properly, water supply during floods and also droughts. And especially in regions where there's high arsenic in the groundwater, it can also dilute this. And of course, uh, some issues which are uh, gaining uh, more of a societal challenge also, such as um, spills or terrorism, it's also a safeguard against that. And here in the right picture, we see one such riverbank filtration well. It's a proof RBFL, which was built consequent to the uh, disastrous flood of 2013 in Uttar So now this is sort of the bit of the scientific background of our uh, research collaboration. And I would like to now start with how it all started and take you on a sort of a short story. And it all started way back in 2005 when we had our first project uh, which was coordinated by our university. And one of the main partners in India was the Indian Institute of uh, Technology and uh, in Roorkee. And of course, there were also some other partners, but the IIT Roorkee played the dominant role amongst all the Indian partners. And um, over the years, of course, <clears throat> uh, these projects focused on the optimization and investigation of riverbank filtration and also a bit on energy efficiency of uh, pumps. One uh, important aspect was also the intercultural training and so especially of the DAA, the alumni who visited each other's countries. A major milestone was of course in 2005 when we started an MOU with IIT Roorkee. Of course, a lot of projects were done since then with uh, IIT Roorkee, but also with other partners. Uh, notable amongst them uh, is the Sustainable Urban Water Management, which was funded by a new passage to India of the DAAD. And this I would like to also highlight as being one very important mobility program in the last few years, which I would say was exceptionally beneficial also to not only us, but also to a multitude of other uh, partners. Uh, we had a big EU project, and then of course we again had a DAAD, project under a new passage to India. And right now we are fortunate to be uh, have another project which I will come to in the end. Nevertheless, in the IIT Roorkee, we had a very nice and long collaboration. Uh, and one of the key persons, if you look in this picture, if you look here, especially in the right picture, this gentleman here, uh, uh, standing to the Right to the left of the lady, that is Professor Pradeep Kumar, and to the right, Professor Indu Merotra. These two persons were two key figures who, with whom most of our research was done. And they were also the key per persons who used to host uh, the students when they would go from Germany to IIT Roki. And of course, we have here in the rightmost image Professor Thomas Krishek. And of course, um, together with Thomas, uh, we hosted also the students who used to come uh, for the re research stay, uh, the Indian students who would come to Dresden. Uh, just to give you a bit of an idea, the work was multifaceted. Of course, it concentrated on water resources and civil engineering a lot. Also, we had some very basic tasks like leveling, which are common to all engineering subjects, but we had also a bit more specialized work like drilling of wells, Consequently, then uh, determining the geotechnical parameters of the material from the aquifer, performing experiments in the lab to determine the attenuation of pollutants, uh, determination of pathogens in the field, sampling, and also, of course, here some organic micropollutants. So all these are images practically of uh, a lot of the German students and, of course, also some of the Indian students who did a lot of the work uh, there in <coughs> India. Uh, one notable key person in the IIT Roti was, is, doc, or rather was, Dr. Mendelssohn Rongang. And approximately at the same time, while I was doing my PhD, he was a, 
is a very dear colleague of mine. He was doing his PhD there, and he was also investigating, of course, the tank filtration uh, uh, in Roki. And after he finished Roki, he joined the Ganeshwar Brahma Engineering College in Pokhrachar in Assam. Uh, it's a government of Assam institution, and um, this person is also key because he's one of them. Uh, fortunately, uh, we've known each other now for a very long time, and uh, he's also he has been in Dresden a couple of times also through the DAAD programs, and he has now uh, he is really I would say kind of spearheading the work on bank filtration also in uh, Assam especially. So let's come. Now, there's one problem, however, in 2016, and that is Professor Pradeep Kumar and Professor Merotra were retired. And with that, uh, there was no more, I would say, succession. And consequently, unfortunately, how it is in a lot of these academic collaborations, uh, the collaboration with the IIT Roti practically, uh, yeah, I would say in practical terms ended. Of course, we still have the MOU, but unfortunately, there was nothing much happening on the ground. Because, of course, a lot of this is person-to-person -person collaboration. Nevertheless, uh, through some of our previous projects, we were also fortunate to build some contacts with other people. And um, like this map here shows also, there's a lot of potential for uh, replicating riverbank filtration, not only in North India, but also in other parts of India, especially in these gray areas here where there's a lot of alluvium. So there's also scope for a lot more scientific work. And consequently, uh, we were fortunate to have a few DAAD and DSD projects under the project-based personnel exchange programs. And two of these, one was with the Anna University in Chennai, and another is currently ongoing with the Central Mechanical Engineering Research Institute in Durgapur. And at this place in Guwahati, where we are also trying to do some work right now is of course, Dr. Ronghang is engaged here. Consequently, we were lucky to get this large project, uh, which was the expansion of the Indo-German Competence Center for RBF, which aimed to develop at least four riverbank filtration demonstration sites in India. These are shown with D1 to D4 or up to D5. One of these is with the Banaras Hindu University in Varanasi. So the key take-home message here is that the that we were able to get this project was, I would say, to a very large extent, the result of course, the many years, of, <clears throat> you could say more than 10 years of previous work, a lot of it supported by the DAAD also, and also the DAAD TST uh, projects with uh, the personal based uh, exchange programs, which are of course also uh, uh, fortunately co supported by the Department of Science and Technology, the government of India. Another aspect which is important is the linkage with other Indo-German uh, institutes, such as, for instance, the Indo-German Center for Sustainability at IIT Madras, uh, where we uh, are now also uh, have within this CCRBF project where we have some collaboration. There are a lot of, of course, impacts. I don't want to go through all of these, um, but one of the impacts which I would say gives one a lot of personal satisfaction as perhaps is this contribution to the improvement of drinking water to about 300,000 people in Northern India, especially in the state of Uttarakhand, but also a few other areas because one has been able to highlight the um, effect, the positive effect of riverbank filtration. Um, and also in Uttarakhand, a few new sites have been constructed, which has increased the per capita water supply. Um, there are a few lessons learned. Of course, one should take the time to network. It's very important. Uh, one needs to document and validate verbal information uh, because a lot of it is on the mobile phone. One has to accept hierarchies. This is important, especially for people from Germany, I would say. And of course, uh, it's important to involve students in research. I'd just like to highlight this very briefly through this book by Yang Liu, Ms. Yang Liu. She wrote a very interesting geographical book. And if you look here, the blue is Germany, the red is India. So it's a very classical, it highlights in a very classical way how uh, different the approaches 
uh, in Germany and India, especially also how hierarchy, how that stands out in India. And of course, how Germans, they thoroughly document everything. In India, it's all recorded on the mobile. So these are just a few examples. Um, uh, oh, sorry. I So I would also just like to um, conclude now. Of course, I thank the DAE a lot. But what I would also like to add is that we are grateful for the continuous support of the students, also for the exchange. Uh, and um, it's this collaboration has also been successful over the long term. And I think as water management gains even more importance in future, not only in India, but also in Germany, because bank filtration is going to be more important in Germany, um, these uh, exchange programs would need to be continued and build a backbone. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sandhu for that uh, very insightful perspective on the context of Indo-German network, and especially on water resources management. Um, we'll be talking about it a little later, but before that, I'd like to welcome our next speaker now for uh, the Indian perspective, Ms. Finu Jos, representing the Christ deemed to be university based in Bangalore. She's associated with the International Exchange Programs of Management Studies and as a member of Faculty for Marketing, Entrepreneurship and General Management subjects at the School of Business and Management. She has a keen interest in studying social entrepreneurship and innovation in addition to facilitating learner-centered teaching along with communication and marketing. Additionally, she's enthusiastic about any value addition activities that enhance the student community. We're looking forward to hearing from you, Finu. The floor is yours. Thank you, Naina. I'm uh, obliged to DAAD. Uh, good evening, everyone here. And good in Atmitag, if I know to say that right, to Dr. Sandhu and all others joining from across the globe. Uh, I hope all of you are keeping well, and uh, I'm sure this is one of the privileges that we as an online community have to meet each other without taking flights and traveling all the way across the globe. So let's just nurture our relationships forward. Uh, I, I will focus on what is our journey at Christ and what I think we could do a little more. Uh, for making my bandwidth a little more convenient for all of you, I'll switch off my video and I'll come back on screen when we have some questions to take. So, uh, Christ University, uh, we are... Uh, is this visible, uh, Nana? Screen is okay? Yes, it is. It is. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, Christ University is a multidisciplinary uh, university. We have engineering, we have arts and science, we have commerce and management. So, all disciplines across five campuses in NCR Delhi, in Lavasa, Pune, as well as in Bangalore, we have three campuses and uh, we have a lot of uh, options for students to uh, study with us, except for uh, paramedical or medical education, we venture into all other disciplines. Uh, as is known to all of you, reasons to study abroad, most of our students want to get a global exposure, they want to avail different style of education, methodologies, pedagogies that differ, they like to experience culture, lifestyle, and finally their career opportunities also increase. So I'm sure all this remains the same for everyone. And this is what we also learned in our journey of academic collaborations with uh, other international universities. So students tell us that uh, these are things that they have as a takeaway. They, they learn a lot of teamwork, they learn cultural diversity, uh, they have a lot of hands-on work that they get to do, and that's something that they enjoy, uh, which might not be possible in our context because of our numbers or whatever. We have a lot of social interactions that they come back and share as very, very amazing experiences of their exchange uh, experiences. Also, a sense of ownership is what most of us learn from students who go abroad and come because they feel that uh, the academic environment uh, in the partner universities help them to own the learning that they want to invest in, which might not always be true in India or in our context. 
uh, the FHWS University at Uzburg, uh, Schweinfurt is the partner university since 2010. We've been sending students. We also have welcomed a lot of students and faculty members. A lot of our faculty members from the School of Business and Management have been visiting the school and have learned a lot. And most of our best practices that we learn or we engage in are thanks to certain experiences that our faculty and our students bring back to us. Just to quickly glance through some testimonials that our students have. Uh, most of them tell us about this emphasis on the real world based projects. So I think uh, that's something that they appreciate the German education uh, that uh, highlights about what are live cases, what are projects that they could get into and help solve them uh, on on the field. And that's why they appreciate the experience that they have at FHWS. Uh, there are also students who say that there is a lot of investment they do in this study abroad program, one year in Christ at India, one year at FHWS in, the, in Germany. Their careers are shaped by this, and that's something that they also appreciate about uh, programs that are collaborative between countries, and they definitely rate these as better. So from their side, when I was preparing for this, I told Naina, I'm speaking to some alumni and I want to know what are benefits, what are challenges, what are strategies that we could uh, get as highlights from the alumni experiences. And as predicted, most of them say cultural competence is one of the best benefits that uh, learners have. And the professors, uh, which uh, the, the methodology of teaching, which is very unique experience, and uh, to say the least, uh, travel as youngsters, they love, not just youngsters, all of us love traveling. And uh, the last two years have uh, made us feel so bad about traveling from the bedroom to the bathroom to the kitchen. But uh, the travel experience is something that is unrivaled. And I think that's something that they come back with. It's a lifetime opportunity for them when they get to see places in and around Germany. And that's why they say that it enhances the benefits that they expected from an exchange program. Uh, finally, also the biggest benefit is the employment opportunities, both at uh, German uh, organizations where they did their internships, or when they come back to India, they have a better chance in organizations, uh, maybe Bosch, maybe anything else that, uh, that offer them a, a higher chance of employment because of this German experience. Uh, they also find a lot of challenges because if they directly go to a MBA program in the uh, country of partnership without a prior work experience, it makes uh, sometimes it makes it difficult for them to adhere to those work ethics, professionalism, etc. So it's always nice if they have a work experience. So without a work experience is definitely a challenge for a student. Getting those sociocultural training mechanisms in place might not be possible for us as institutions before they go or because of the lack of work experience, they are not able to know how they should work in a context which is different from their cultural context. And also because they, in India, the, the education is generally sponsored uh, by parents and uh, their financial stability is a concern most of most often. So that's also a challenge when study abroad is uh, a possibility for students. But what are strategies that they would suggest is that uh, they make the stay a little more longer. For example, if it's a, a six month, or one semester, can be extended to two semesters. They also talk about how German language of compulsion of knowing German language helps them to interact with uh, local communities and learn a little bit more to gel well with the community there. Also the cultural differences, how, how ma matters of etiquettes and mannerisms uh, make a lot of difference to their experience in the country that they visit. Uh, for us as an organization or an institution, uh, we have a lot of challenges in maintaining these relationships with alumni who've come back from educations abroad, uh, a sense of ownership, uh, who takes up the costs for maintaining these uh, relationships with the alumni, sometimes institutions, sometimes the partner institutions. So it makes a lot of uh, difficult decision making uh, is, is a difficult decision making is generally difficult because there are a lot of costs involved in hosting alumni and keeping them uh, 
clued into what is happening with the programs now, how are juniors performing. So it definitely involves some costs and that's something that we are really working with as a challenge. We also know that to create a sense of community and networking among the alumni, every batch that goes and comes back or doesn't come back, how do we help keep create that community? What platforms we use? So how do we keep them connected to us? Is there a, is there a platform which is not just Facebook? Is there a forum that they can keep connected? continuously discussing about their experiences. That's definitely something that we are working for to understand how these challenges can be reduced and how we iron out those differences. Uh, finally, I think uh, this is something that uh, I was uh, deliberating upon and I was just talking to some of my colleagues as well, that what is the way forward? How do we look at role of alumni in the collaborations that we have? As organizations, we never bothered about internationalizations, perhaps for a long time. It's only in the last decade or two that we consciously started focusing on internationalization and all study abroad opportunities uh, are just touch and go, which is not uh, something that sustains for a long time. So we, we think a way forward, one strategy could be to offer some short term certificate courses to the alumni who have finished an MBA, who finished an engineering, but they want to come back and stay connected with both our universities. So if there is a collaborative certificate course that partner university and the host university can offer, it would be something uh, which is helping us keep in touch with them and they would have a good word of mouth for their juniors or for their friends and relatives around their circle. And uh, most of us know how uh, COVID-19 has facilitated certificate courses online. So there's nothing to stop us now in offering online courses. So that's one strategy. We also think that wherever they go and get work, uh, their workspaces, if it is corporates or their own family businesses, if we could have some collaboration for consulting, for research-based projects, which is facilitated through us as a university or which is in collaboration with our partner university, it could help us move a little forward with more strength and vigor. Uh, I also think that we need to create platforms which are uh, constantly there and sustainable. For example, if I am the uh, international cell coordinator this year, there must be some other faculty who will take over from me next year. So how do we sustain this? Is, is it person based or process based? So making it process based helps us better. And that's why we think that building platforms for higher education institutions to remain connected with alumni is very important. And then tagging along partner universities, partner countries, all of that will be possible. We think that because of these platforms, there is a lot of spillover effect. We might be able to get better faculty recruitment, better faculty research opportunities, improved placements can happen because recruiters watch what is happening on the websites and these online platforms and help us bring in a little more improvement in placements and recruitments or even internship opportunities. And finally, there are a lot of collaborative entrepreneurial opportunities for our students, for their businesses, and also for partner universities, the centers that we have, Center for Innovation, Center for Research, all of these can be collaborated, collaborative uh, work that is done with the partner university, but also including the alumni that uh, come in from us. So uh, from our our side on the top of the mind that what comes to our mind is uh, are these uh, strategies and we think that this is something that we should invest in in moving forward uh, so thank you for your patience and uh, i'm sure i look forward to some more inputs and insights about how christ can improve with relationships and collaborations better thank you naina Thank you so much, uh, Finu, for outlining some very important aspects of alumni relations, how they can be strategized. Uh, there were some in interesting points regarding sense of ownership, social cultural aspects that also uh, overlapped with what Dr. Sandhu mentioned, and in general, how alumni relations can help with academic development. Uh, important facet of alumni relations and internationalization. Up next, uh, I'd like to welcome two of our speakers for, for perspectives from Nepal. Firstly, Mr. Rupesh Shreshtha, 
um, the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences in Vienna. He's an architect with practical experience in urban development and post earthquake reconstruction projects in Nepal. With the, uh, with the help of a DAD scholarship, he completed his Master of Science in Natural Resources Management and Development at the University of Applied Sciences in Cologne in 2016. Rupesh has also been actively involved with the Germany Alumni Association called Nepal German Academic Association or NEGAS, which aims at strengthening academic relations between the, the two countries, Nepal and Germany. And he was also DAD Young Ambassador. Uh, he's been fulfilling his role of an engaged alumnus in international relations, promoting Germany as a destination for higher education and with much aplomb, might I add. Thank you for that, Rupesh. And joining Rupesh for this presentation is Ms. Rumi Singh Maharjan. Welcome, Rumi, to you too. She's an architect, also at the Rabindra Puri Foundation for Conservation and is currently living and working in the Kathmandu Valley, Nepal. Her areas of focus as an architect are sustainable architecture and traditional vernacular architecture. She's also worked at the Michels Architect Tour Bureau in Berlin and Sustainable Mountain Architecture, Lalitpur, Nepal. And additionally, she um, has also held teacher's assistant positions in Kathmandu and at the Anhalt University of Applied Sciences, Dessau in Germany. She was also awarded the DAAD scholarship for foreign graduates in the field of architecture for her master's degree. And she is currently a DAD Young Ambassador um, and helping us, supporting us with our many activities. I welcome you both, Rupesh and Rumi, and I believe Rumi will begin. So I um, hand over the virtual mic to you, Rumi. Looking forward to your input. Thank you, Nana. Uh, a very good evening, good afternoon, and warm welcome to all the participants of the conference Connecting Germany and South Asia, the Future of Higher Education and Research Cooperation. I am Rumi, and today I will be presenting on German alumni and internationalization, context and experiences from Nepal, together with Rupesh Shreshta. I will be focusing more on the basics of alumni and internationalization, and Rupesh will be sharing his experience at Nepal German Academic Association, NEGAS, in Nepal. Next. Um, internationalization is one of the major forces imparting and shaping higher education as it evolves to meet the challenges of the 21st century. Jane Knight, Higher Education in Turmoil, The Changing World of Internationalization, 2008. Next. Alumni are brand ambassadors. Alumni, also known as alumni ambassadors, Anyone and indeed everyone can and should be an advocate for their institution. International alumni are those graduates who have returned home from studying abroad or who are working outside their home country. Next. Internationalization is the process of integrating international and multicultural perspectives and experiences into learning, discovery and engagement mission of higher education. It is about taking the rest of the world seriously, not only one's home country. It is a formal term for thinking globally before acting locally. Next. Um, internationalization has a close relationship with students, institutions, communities, and the nation, and above all, the nation. For students, it develops critical thinking, essential to contribute as global citizens, and compete in the international marketplace. For institution, it expands research opportunities and live in faculty scholarships and teaching and provides pathways to national and international distinction. For communities, it links different communities to the world, expands opportunities while enhancing global competitiveness. And for nation, it contributes to national security and economy and prepare future world leaders who understand and value one's country and the world. Next is a word wall uh, uh, giving a summary of alumni and internationalization has uh, terms that are very important to these topics. Next. Uh, John Welty, President, California State University shares, our world requires that higher education accept the responsibility for preparing globally 
educated students. We cannot fail in this responsibility. Marilyn Stilt, UC Davis student, Humboldt University, Berlin, Germany, shares, whether or not times are uncertain does not affect the reality that international experience is necessary for success in most fields and an advantage in every career field. And John F. Kennedy, 35th President of the United States of America, I think the success of any school can be measured by the contribution the alumni make to our nation, national life. Thus, uh, emphasizing uh, once again the importance of alumni and internationalization, uh, I would like to request Rupesh Reshra to continue uh, the further presentation. Thank you. Uh, so I will take it uh, forward uh, from Rumi's last statement where she mentioned that uh, the success of schools are measured by how successful alumni are. So uh, uh, I, I bring perspective from Nepal. So I was secretary of Nepal German Academic Association, which is an alumni network or alumni association in Nepal. And we were conducting alumni activities. And this is a let's say practitioners practice practical perspective that we are, that uh, we have from Nepal. So what we say as alumni network is like this is something that exchanges on different levels and scales. And there's a few good communication between alumni and alumni groups. We also have vision like greater mobility inside the region for Germany alumni. And of course, like uh, my previous speaker mentioned, the professional expertise exchange and job exchange and other consulting opportunities must be a part of alumni activities inside. And of course, academic exchanges play a vital role in alumni activities, research projects, joint publications. These are very important to maintain a thriving alumni inside a country or inside a region. And then of course, we must have knowledge repositories, field specific, origin specific, and then we must have networking events. And of course, the trainings are all as highlighted by uh, my previous speaker. It's very important to keep alumni active and like job ready or job relevant. And of course, there's also mentoring uh, returnees from Germany and sharing job prospects is also an activity that uh, which alumni networks can undertake. The commission sessions, cultural events, database exchange are some other activities which alumni activity alumni networks must or should uh, undertake. So why join an alumni club? So this is something I tell to my colleagues who return from Germany or who are in Germany, if they want to join alumni network in South Asia or in Nepal, let's say Negas. So when you are in, at a German alumni network or community, you have a sense of belonging. So of course you also have a sense of giving back to Germany and to South Asia, you are you are there is a possibility of professional and personal development, and of course there is a leadership development and networking that comes along with an alumni club or being a member of alumni club. I share with you some of the activities that we did in Nepal. So these are some of the events that we did, like annual general meeting. We were there for DAD on ambassadors and research ambassadors workshop. Uh, we were there for study in Euro Fair. You can see Nena and uh, Apurva there uh, from DAD New Delhi. And of course, we used to organize picnics, which is like a cultural activity or like fun activity within our alumni club. And of course, we have interaction with DAD or like DAD scholarship counseling. Uh, we used to do the collaboration in Germany, Missy Kathmandu and Kothe Centrum. We used to organize short academic courses, for example, writing a scientific proposal with a prof with Professor Krul from TU Munich. It was in 2019. And of course, we used to participate in different kind of activities, events. And then we also have uh, we're active in um, uh, meeting with other alumni clubs from all over the world. We were there in Bonn uh, talking with other alumni clubs. We were also there in participating in events of German embassy, like 60 years of diplomatic relations between Germany. And there is Germany celebrating Germany Day inside German embassy, giving alumni talks and also having MOUs with Gothe Centrum for academic exchange and giving talks in other field specific uh, topics. And so this is one another top program we organized at Kathmandu Urban University called Retrospect and Prospect of Nepal German Relations, the role of alumni in Nepal's development. So we used to also, uh, we also have discussed on what roles can alumni play in Nepal. Um, and in Corona times, we have uh, conducted relief campaigns, so like giving back to society kind of thing. So we collected donation from our life members and then distributed that to uh, people who need it and also to Nepal government and there is a regional appreciation from critical municipality which appreciate our efforts and then in Corona times of course we could not go to any places organize events like face to face but then we used zoom or let's say other uh, online platforms and organized online counselings online online counselings and we actually we were trying to give back uh, our knowledge to prospective students. 
Of course, uh, make, conducting alumni activities also comes with challenges, and this is our experience from Nepal. So it requires substantial time commitment, and it is like a voluntary, and not all can be actively involved. Quick and tangible results may not be seen quickly, and how to measure the advantage is always a problem, like evaluation, uh, how much are alumni contributing to society, or how much are they are contributing to Germany. Uh, this is a bit the intangible kind of thing. And of course, when we design alumni activities, it's interdisciplinary approach is necessary, as we are from different diverse backgrounds. Some are engineers, some are doctors, some are from uh, natural sciences. So consensus building takes a lot of time, but it's worth it. It's worth the process. And of course, misunderstandings are frequent because we have a cultural and professional language, and it's not common. So that also has to be taken care. And of course, we have biases. Like we want some someone to do easy programs, someone very specific programs, and having a consensus or like compromise is take time consuming. And of course, working when we are back in South Asia, then it means like our communication gets lesser with Germany or with Europe. That has to be bridged. And this is one for specific for Nepal. There's this um, BMZ 2030 strategy, which is like German government is going back from government cooperation in Nepal, which is very sad. And this is also like a kind of, this gives a sense of uh, unclarity or uncertainty in Nepal about what is going to happen. Are, will the alumni numbers increase? Do people want, will, go, will people go to Germany? Like they are going now to first studies, will they come back? So these are some of the uncertainties. These are some of the challenges we have to still tackle and how will DAD programs uh, be affected or continued? Of course, it comes with opportunities, like my previous speaker said, we can have alumni networks also in a South Asian scale, we can have research grants, we can conduct workshops, and also we have like consulting opportunities and mobility to tap resources of uh, our fellow alumni. And of course, we can establish community of practice like formation of German Alumni Architects Association or Engineers Group or Mathematics Group. This is a, a smaller graph uh, that, I, uh, that I would like to focus on, which is about South Asian students going to Germany in a year. Of course, India is a, uh, has a lot of uh, students going and is in top place. Nepal comes third, uh, but we are a different, uh, uh, we are different countries and different demographic, different population. So in terms of that, when we see um, with this graph, I would like to show that if a survey is conducted among 100,000 Nepalese, 5.2 will be turning out as students who are going to Germany for higher education, and which is the highest among South Asia. So we as an alumni, we are still trying our best to share our knowledge to junior colleagues who want to go to Germany. But then to be honest, like many colleagues, many students who want to go to Germany, they, they drop out in between because seeing the difficulties in application process. Of course, as an alumni, we try our best to guide them, but of course um, we have limited capacity, like, our, like I said, challenges like time commitment, we have our own jobs. So this is something we still are trying to work on. So with this, I would like to conclude my, our presentation, uh, Rumi and myself. So thank you, danke, Taniwa. Thank you, Rupesh and Rumi, um, for that for that presentation. You also highlighted some important points in terms of intra-regional collaboration and not just inter-regional collaboration. Um, I'd like to address the audience members once again. Um, and request them to pose their questions or comments, if any, um, if you are a representative of a higher education institution, whether it's um, from India or from Germany or from South Asia or Europe, then uh, I think our panel and I would love to hear about your impulses in terms of alumni affairs and um, what can be done to address some of the challenges that uh, have already been outlined by our speakers. And, um, Hopefully, while those questions trickle in, I would like to begin by asking uh, this to Dr. Sandhu, but I think all uh, panel members are free to address this. Dr. Sandhu, you mentioned also that exchange helps with intercultural competencies of the alumni. It improves their understanding of the challenges faced um, and also career milestones of uh, alumni are achieved through their entire career span. You mentioned also the indispensable nature of, a, of an alumni network for internationalization, juggling through various roles in their career span. And it, it's certainly not easy probably starting out. How, according to you, uh, can one make these collaborations within internationalization sustainable? I think that is one key word that can be applied to internationalization as well. Starting with a successful project is one thing, but sustaining it over many years is another. What do you think is the key? So I think you uh, uh, got a bang on point on target. <laughs> that is uh, what is uh, what makes these networks sustainable. And I think 
the uh, my colleagues uh, and the other speakers who spoke afterwards they also touched upon this aspect uh, i think <clears throat> one has to approach uh, one, one, let's say simply and straight put one cannot put all one's eggs into one basket that that means that it's not i would say necessarily always the best just to have a cooperation with one person for instance it's good to have a cooperation with a few more persons um, of course to a very large extent, this also depends on the personal interests. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> for instance, um, uh, it's uh, also a question about how much visibility we create about the work, uh, what we are doing. So, for instance, um, when we started with our first DAD project and the first few in the beginning, a new passage to India, there was a uh, very good um, I would say feedback from our students in the HDW and a lot of students from civil engineering, not only civil engineering, but also other faculties, they wanted to do an internship or they wanted to go for a study exchange to India. So that was very positive. But um, there was maybe a bit of uh, apprehension in other faculties to accommodate students from India. So that's one thing which, while we Personally, in our projects, we emphasize it and we want it that there should be this interaction. This might not be the case at a overall at the university level. No? So that's why it's still very much, despite even if one doesn't want it to be, like Miss um, Joes said, that um, not make it institutional and not so much based on person, but um, I, it's, it's difficult to do that. Uh, and particularly because um, uh, it's also a lot of effort to um, supervise uh, students, especially, no, I mean, it's likewise for German students going to India, they also have to be looked after and taken care of, but likewise also Indian students who come to Germany, um, one also has to um, spend time with them and just how Mr. Schwechter also highlighted it. So this is um, one aspect which um, I would think, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Finu, would you like to address that too? Um, rather, do you do you think there is a need for a dedicated alumni program, or does it make more sense to involve international alumni within the framework of university projects? What do you think works better? Uh, I don't know whether I'm an expert, but I'll I feel that it should be more organic and it should grow out of. Uh, personal relations as well. I know I made a contradictory point earlier, uh, but uh, for example, if Dr. Sandhu and me are friends and we develop a professional relationship and we start working on a project, we rope in some students who are presently studying with us. We have some alumni who studied with us and want to be interested. That becomes a very interested cohort. And then we need to get the senior leadership of the institutions involved in it. Even if we get one person from the central leadership to invest in our uh, partnership, not invest in terms of money or time, but at least interest. Uh, how much of support can we get from an institutional uh, perspective? Uh, that will help us go a long way. And I have seen that uh, keeping alumni uh, invested in ours full time is a big challenge because they have taken up jobs, they have their own businesses, families, and it's not right on our part to ask them to come back here full time. But having a group of volunteers from the present cohort of students has worked well in our context. And teachers definitely, I might not not be good in uh, research on riverbanks, but if I find some colleague of mine who's interested in research on that point, I just need to connect Dr. Sandhu and that person. And I think from there it will take. But in our experience in the last five decades of international relations, it's always been person to person. Because I have spent time with Dr. Sandhu, he's ready to invest in a larger team, which is with me. And that is the foundation of any relationship for uh, partnerships and organizations. But I also think that if institutional leadership is not invested, all this will not sustain. And both of us might retire and go and there's nothing left in the partnership mm -hmm. at all. So evolving it organically is one important thing through students, through alumni and through teachers. But also key role to play is of the senior leadership is my personal take on this. Thank you, Finu. I think uh, you also hit 
the nail on the head with the sustainability aspect of it, because this is the only way it can really sustain without, uh, you know, individuals having to bear the burden of it for years and years to come. And also on the other hand, for the alumni, uh, you made a very good point regarding they have their own jobs, they have their roles as professionals and uh, perhaps some other roles that, that may, they may have taken on. Um, this is also one of the questions we got. Um, I'd like to ask you, Rumi and Rupesh, because you have also the German perspective. You are also alumni of uh, German universities and German higher education institutions. Um, how do you? How does one keep the alumni engaged? What is it? What is in for them? Um, it's not just their contribution, but also um, what do they get out of it? Simply put, Rupesh, would you like to go first? Rumi, would you like to uh, go? Your perspective, please. <laughs> sure. Um, for me, uh, personally speaking, I mean, I, I, I will share my experience. Like coming back from Germany, the first thing I was thinking of was where can I, uh, where can I go? Where can, is there an organization or an alumni uh, where I can be involved to get in touch, to be in touch with? Uh, uh, people who have similar experiences like mine, you know, so I feel that, uh, like, uh, the sense of belonging, I was looking for a sense of belonging where I could have, um, germ, uh, people returning from Germany and had similar experiences to me. So for me, uh, to have a personal kind of a relationship with these different people from different, uh, backgrounds from interdisciplinary backgrounds was important. And for me, uh, also another thing that was important was. I uh, want to have a continuous relationship with Germany uh, in terms of, uh, I mean, I, I have decided to come back to work in Nepal, but then uh, in terms of research or in terms of volunteering works or in terms of uh, the dadian ambassador that I had, I, I wanted to be. So, you know, this connection sort of connection, I think uh, it gives me inspiration in some ways also. So in those terms, I think it is um, beneficial uh, to join uh, to join an alumni and to be involved in the activities. Yeah, that I say. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rupesh, would you like to add to that? Yes, thank you. Um, Rumi pointed out uh, exactly the sense of belonging. Um, for me, it was also a matter of like uh, networking and leadership development. So um, when you are there and developing activities, it's like uh, you get connected with people and uh, you learn from them as well. And uh, if uh, uh, I mean, um, to be honest, uh, not everybody wants to join an alumni club because it comes with uh, uh, some level of uh, responsibility as well and uh, they are all busy with their jobs and uh, so i would say well, well, from my experience uh, that uh, we must have a diverse kind of activities some alumni they want to just come once a year and say hi to their fellow colleagues uh, like enjoy and talk about germany octoberfest beer that that's that's their perspective some they want to join once per six months maybe a seminar or a workshop some actually very they are very engaged and actually want to meet once every week so there should be like a different scales of activities, different kinds of uh, forms of communication that caters to their needs. And we must not think that everybody will come to every activity. And uh, uh, so we must like, let's say their, what alumni think, their, the, the, the activities must be designed according to their perspective. And I think that gets uh, along very well. And of course, like uh, when you ask for people to come in and do voluntary activities, uh, there also has to be some form of respect or some form of like gratitude. So it can be like uh, thank you, simple thank you email, or maybe some appreciation, or having some parties, uh, throwing parties. So that those kinds of uh, thing, I think that will engage alumni. Uh, and like this shows that um, uh, coming to an alumni club is of actually benefit. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. So to sum it up, targeted communication, targeted activities that may work for a certain group, but may not work for a certain other group. And uh, that just brings me to your presentation uh, and that it, it's a really good example of how strengthening alumni relations in terms of capacity, capacity building can tackle global challenges, like in the context of SDGs, for example, um, or how global networks really impact local projects. Uh, Dr. Sandhu, your presentation also highlighted this aspect. Um, it's a good example of cross-section of region 
regional and subject focused networking um, both together um, and alumni are given in this case the needed platform um, also to become brand ambassadors or advisors or mentors also uh, i i would like to throw this question to everybody what do you think is the one quality then that sets the or an alumni group as an important stakeholder apart what's one quality that needs to be nurtured i, I think um, the, the, what the, the others uh, said uh, the sense of belonging it's very important i think this just um i think we are all proud i myself have been a dad alumni and i think we are all also very proud to be well let's say called dad alumni and I, it, it um, also when i've noticed that when one is in in, in india um, it's always this um, association with uh, <clears throat> Germany that others see, and it's also the quality of the work uh, and so on, which gives the uh, which, which makes it so worthwhile and so important to uh, feel part of, uh, the, let's say, this DAD network also, because one has to remember at the end of the day that also because of whatever I have achieved today and where I am today, it's also to a large extent in the academic, in one's academic career that it is the because of the DAD. And I think that out of many European countries and even I think worldwide, um, I think the DAD really has a very, very strong footprint and uh, which, which I don't see so much for other countries. I mean, maybe, maybe I'm not an expert for other countries. I've not seen so much, but even it's the, the, the DAD is not only funding um, mobility or <clears throat> uh, work between South Asia and Germany is also with worldwide with other countries. Mm -hmm. Pino? Um, I don't know if I understood the question right, but I my perspective on that is that, uh, like you mentioned, uh, all of us, human nature, what is in it for me? So incentivizing people is very important uh, me as a faculty when i'm investing so much time in networking and collaborating sending emails across what do i benefit from this and is there a is there a colleague who appreciates me is there a boss who says this is good work or are there students who recommend ask for recommendations to go abroad all of these matter to me as a member of the faculty so i'm sure alumni also look forward to contributing provided there is a value addition for for their time and their effort. And that value addition could come in terms of like Rupesh mentioned, some appreci appreciative email, some letter or some, uh, you know, um, get togethers in the year, maybe like he said, you know, some fun activities, but they don't have time to get together all the time. But that sense of ownership that uh, that what in intertwines all of us together is very important, but also giving them visibility as an institution, as partners, if uh, FHWS and as Christ, we have a partnership that highlights the role of alumni, I'm sure they will spend quality time with us. In bits and pieces, no problem. But like I mentioned, it should be very organically evolved, not imposed and artificially done that every year, 26 Jan, we'll do this meeting. That's not going to work. It has to be evolving. Invite them for a webinar, call them and ask them to spend some time with us. That might help. I hope I answered mm -hmm. that. Uh, mm -hmm. Indeed. Uh, Rumi, would you like to add to that? Um, how how could how could one incentivize uh, alumni activity in terms of internationalization? Um, for me, I think um, uh, the state of mind of uh, a continuous learning is important. I mean, for different people, uh, their priorities are different. But if you if, if a person is uh, joining an alumni, it means that uh, he or she is interested to con uh, to a continuous learning process you know I, I talked about uh, being inspired because you meet so many people in these in this alumni association that you're inspired in different ways that's how it it has for me so I think uh, so to to uh, have uh, workshops or uh, you know specific um, like like uh, Miss Sindhu had uh, shared before like uh, some certificate courses, if those kind of things would be there, I think it's it would definitely be a very um, good thing for um, yeah, like uh, inviting people in uh, to be a member of an alumni. I think yes, the learning process. I feel it's very important mm -hmm. to be to be there. 
being inspired and and having the curiosity to learn i think that's also a very nice point uh, offering the alumni something where they say oh yeah this is something i think i can gain gain some value from um activities as a germ as a higher education institution and that in turn motivates them then to contribute as well and i think here uh, we also need to acknowledge that the culture of alumni relations is is very different in europe in terms of you know what is an alumni or alumnus um as opposed to let's say some other countries like the us where um, a lot of focus is on development which is a fancy word for fundraising let's say so i think it it's really uh, defining it for yourself as an institution and uh, yeah what do you offer at the end of the day and who, how both sides can benefit i'd um, yeah i I'd, I'd also like to uh, leave some of the audience members with this thought so that they can also as higher education institution representatives think about how you kind of you know uh, bring alumni relations within internationalization together. Um, I think th th that's all the time we have for this session. Uh, I'm very, very grateful to all of you, Dr. Sandhu, Finu, Rumi, and Rupesh, that you joined us. Uh, I think uh, any successful internationalization project begins with identifying strengths, identifying weaknesses, and then taking it from there and involving the alumni also um, in the internationalization strategy. It was really interesting to hear from all of you getting all these insights, and I'm sure it was equ equally interesting to the audience. Um, thanks once again uh, to power through this day and for this session and for your contribution. I wish you all a wonderful day and an even exciting day tomorrow. Bye-bye and take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Naina. Thank you, Shikha, and all of you there. Take care. Stay well, all of you. Bye-bye. Thank you.